Good can call it, uh, Hain. Thank the member for her question. It is my priority that examinations to award CCA qualifications, which is the one area that I have direct control over, should go ahead as planned in 2021. However, it is clear that there is a need, um, and I have acknowledged this from the start, of adaptations given uh, where we are this, this year. The first suite of adaptations, which I agreed on the 9th of um, October and then subsequently on the 6th of November for GCSE qualifications, provide a significant reduction in the burden of assessment for young people while still allowing as much opportunity as possible to cover the content of the specifications. I would also, at that stage, agreed a number of health-related adaptations for AS and A-levels. However, the situation has been kept under review and my officials have been working closely with CCA to develop a range of further mitigations and contingencies to respond to the fluid public health uh, situation. That is particularly the case for AS uh, and A-levels. That work is in an advanced stage and has also involved discussions with uh, key stakeholders in terms of partnership at, um, uh, at school principal level. And I hope to be in a position to be able to provide more information on that, that issue very soon. Supplementary, Liz Cummins. Thank the Minister for his answer. Um, and having read the public exam guidance that was published in November, I and many others would still be deeply concerned that the Minister and CCA continue to ignore the concerns of young people, their families and teachers. Um, there will be, st be no level playing field uh, when it comes to the public exam series for next year. And many young people will have had multiple periods of self-isolation um, as, we, as we move forward. So the education experience is very varied. Will the Minister consider directing CCA to add greater optionality um, on the exam papers for 2021 to try and reduce some of the stress felt by our young people? And I suppose, as with a lot of things with education, sometimes it depends what you define as a particular term. Um, optionality, as it's, as it's been generally speaking uh, considered within a pure educational point of view, which is generally speaking the, the issue of having more exam questions from which to choose, there has been direct concerns have been raised. That's one of the options that has been looked at and continues to be looked at. There is a concern that optionality itself in that definition um, then can sometimes be regarded. Indeed, there has been particular concerns raised uh, by particularly um, non-selective schools that optionality in the way that it would be referred to would create problems, particularly for some children with special educational needs and uh, candidates who academically would not be as strong and so therefore could potentially discriminate against them. However, um, as regards that, there are a range of other options, if I can put it that way, for a range of adaptations, particularly that I'm hoping to, to bring forward. Uh, specifically on GCSEs, uh, the situation in many ways we've already gone further in terms of adaptations that would have happened in some other jurisdictions, particularly England. Uh, so there will be a range of options which, as I said, I hope very soon to be able to, to come to a conclusion. I would hope to be in a position that there could be further announcements before Christmas. Uh, to give that people those level of certainty, it has got to take account of the current, uh, the current wider uh, situation because uh, it is about trying to create as level a playing field as possible. I think, in current circumstances, whatever direction myself or indeed any jurisdiction moves in does not create a complete level playing field for anyone. I think that's part of the difficulties because sometimes in making one particular decision. You make something fair for some and unfair for others, so it's about trying to balance that out. But I hope to be in a position to reach uh, a final conclusion on that fairly soon. Well, Daniel McCrossan. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and thank you, uh, Minister, for the answer to your question. Minister, I am very, very concerned. I have put firmly on record my concerns in relation to examinations going ahead, particularly given what happened in the summer and the impact it has had on the mental health of our young people and of teachers in schools. Minister, you are in the bad books of a lot of students and of a lot of teachers, and I think you know that very well. Will the Minister now, given the situation, given how the Children and Young Persons Commissioner has spoken out and the Mental Health Champion, will you cancel examinations this year? No, I won't, because frankly, if we're talking about fairness with people, we've got to take into account, first of all, that the exams that I control will be CCA. So you would immediately, if we cancelled all CCA examinations, put that in a different position from the roughly 20% of students who are doing English board examinations. It would place students in Northern Ireland in a different position, not just uh, from students in England, not just from students in Scotland, Wales, and indeed something which may be potentially of, of greater interest to the member 
the Republic of Ireland who are going ahead with the examinations as well. Every jurisdiction, by one means or another, is going ahead with examinations. Now, the point is, we need to ensure that in terms of grading, we have a level playing field, particularly throughout the United Kingdom. We need to ensure that students are on a level playing field as much as possible amongst themselves within Northern Ireland. But also, we need to have a situation that if we are the only jurisdiction that in all forms was, was abandoning examinations, where would that leave some of our students when making comparisons when it comes to university places and obtaining those places? So, you know, rather than snatching at a populist headline, we've actually got to think this through as to where it actually, where it actually leaves our students in that regard. And the one thing I'm going to do is be absolutely straight with students because uh, I'm with others. Wales, for instance, and I'm sure that members will, will raise this, will say, well, Wales have abandoned exams. Well, they haven't really, because they have, what they have done is they are having external, part of the thing, external assessments, externally set, externally marked, and presumably if there's going to be a level playing field between students and Wales, that will have to be under examination conditions. So in many ways, if it walks like a duck, if it quacks like a duck, it's a duck. Uh, Robbie Butler. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Minister, we're now on the edge of Christmas break for schools with no certainty as to a return date due to the potential for increased COVID transmission over the festive holiday. What impact assessment has your department carried out on the extent of lost classroom learning, particularly for years 11 through to 14? Well, from that point of view, adaptations will be take, which will be put forward will be ones that will cover the, the situation, which will recognise that not every student has faced that. And we'll also need to look at where we can also, within a wider UK context, deal with special considerations for individuals. I would say because, again, as with Northern Ireland, uh, perhaps unsurprisingly, rumours will always abound. There's no plans to delay uh, the return to school in January. I want to see as full uh, as full a uh, opportunity for our young people to have that direct education as, as possible. So let's make sure that there aren't rumours started, which, again, don't have any substance to them. Questions two and seven are withdrawn, and I call Chris Little for the next question. Question three. I thank the member for his, his question. I, hadn't, I wasn't actually aware the question two had been withdrawn. Can I say in relation to that, obviously, as the member will be aware, the setting of admissions criteria by law is a matter for boards of governors of individual schools. Um, and indeed, there was um, guidance have been issued to all post-primary schools on the operation of the transfer procedure to assist in the process. However, given, I think, the unique situation that we find ourselves in, I have also written directly to the Board of Governors uh, of Schools that will be using the entrance test results in their admissions criteria. I have advised, and schools are, um, I'm sure the member will be aware, under, under an obligation that they are then to publish criteria and produce that certainly by the 11th of uh, December. What I have said to them that where they are drafting criteria, uh, that Boards of Governors should consider the, uh, any eventuality where test results are available, but not necessarily for every single student. And as such, um, I've indicated to them that as part of their overall criteria, they should look at, first of all, um, as part of that single set of admissions criteria, how they deal with the uh, students that, uh, for instance, have had to self-isolate and maybe not able to do all the tests. That will also be, I think, they'll be working alongside the test providers. Um, and also, I think I've asked them to. Uh, it is also the case that the schools will each year also apply um, that uh, special circumstances. And I've asked schools as well to review their special circumstances because I suspect there will be a greater call on those this year than in, in previous years. So, while it's for individual schools to determine how they will deal with such applications, uh, once those criteria are completed, they will be published um, directly by the Education Authority at the beginning of the new year. Mr. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Here. There we go. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, the Education Minister has failed to introduce a dedicated code to gather COVID related pupil absence data, but the National Association of Head Teachers surveyed 89 primary schools in November and found, on average, as many as 37 per cent of P7 pupils have experienced a COVID-19 related absence since the start of term. So can I ask the Education Minister yet again, how can it be fair to base post-primary admission on the basis of testing 10-year-old children in such exceptional circumstances? I do admire the, the member with the inventive ways he, his attacks on academic selection seem to take slightly different twists and turns in, in relation to that. Um, and 
under the cover of COVID is, is now the, the, the route in relation to that. The figures that we have in terms of the absences, we have direct information on those who are absent and still able to engage and those who are self-isolating. The figures, I think, from the point of view of the highest point at which that, that reached, which was towards the end of October, was a combined rate of around about 8%. It's a lot lower than that for most of the, the other weeks. And also tends to be slightly lower in primary schools than it is in post-primary schools. But again, I would say to the member that in terms of an alternative situation, and we've seen this with what has been mentioned by a few schools that have, are looking to move away from academic selection this year, the alternatives that they seem to have produced is whether your mum and dad went to the school, whether your older brother went to the school, were, you know, on a range of those things, it is selection by a form of, of family and genetics. And I believe that, that whatever the wider debate is there within academic selection, that, and sometimes it will be a question of if you have a brother, you may get into a school, if you have a sister, you may not, or vice versa. It is accidents of birth, accidents of DNA. And whatever criticisms are there from the point of view of academic selection, at least it is on the basis of the individual merits of the, the applicant. And as such, while there is a wider debate which has gone on for quite a long period of time with a range of views in terms of ac academic selection, to jump in and put those sort of measures in place, I think is only one which will actually exacerbate difference and actually make it for some pupils utterly impossible to get into a school which is based around academic selection. Be they the greatest genius in the land, they would simply be denied because of who they were related to. That doesn't seem to me a particularly satisfactory way to select children uh, for an oversubscribed school. Nicole Pat Sheehan. Um, Minister, you'll be well aware of Sinn Féin's position in, in relation to uh, academic selection and rejection of children. Uh, and participation in these tests shouldn't be equated to support for them. Uh, and um, often it's the only way that children can get into a school that's nearest to their home. So I'm wondering what alternatives is the minister considering to post-primary transfer this year in the context of COVID, of absences from school, of self-isolation and from mental health issues? The point, the, the point of it, and, and look, I appreciate the position of your party has been very consistent on the issue, has been very clear cut in terms of where it, where it comes from. Can I say, in terms, of, in terms of that, I've indicated that academic selection, I'd be supportive of academic selection, I'm also supportive of the right of academic selection. Academic selection is enshrined in law, and the criteria that schools choose, unless they choose something which takes them outside of the law, it is up to the individual boards of governors. Now, we can give them advice which says you need to have a range of criteria to be able to look at eventualities for individuals. But it is ultimately a choice for those schools. Now, there are many fine schools that, 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 uh, across the system that have never used academic selection, only use it partially, and also get absolutely brilliant results. And I welcome those, those schools as well. So I'm not intending to force academic selection on anyone on that basis. But neither am I intending to take it a, that right away from schools. So I'm not planning from that point of view for an alternative. We will give advice, particularly around what is required on health and safety issues. We will give advice that the schools need to be more cognizant this year on a wide range of, of criteria to cover those eventualities. We will give guidance which says that particularly the special circumstances, that each individual school has to apply. It can't be something which can be done on a blanket basis. That those schools need to uh, examine those closely to make sure that they are fit for purpose for this year, but I'm not going to impose a solution uh, on those schools which takes away their right of academic selection. I call Rosemary Barton. Thank you very much, Minister, for your questions so far, or your answers so far. Minister, in regard to the use of academic selection for this cohort of pupils, can you outline any contingency planning discussions your you or your department has had with the grammar schools in response to the recently successful Committee for Education's motion on the same issue? Look, I, I, I thank the member for her question. Look, I have made it very clear that not only is academic se selection is something which is there in legislation. It is also up to the boards of governors. So it's, it's not a question of me coming up with some form of criteria, my department coming up with some criteria. Within that. 
the grammar schools who are using academic selection are perfectly entitled to do so, and I am not going to interfere in that, that right. Now, as I said, there are a range of mitigations that are being put in, this, in place this year because anybody doing any form of public examination will have to follow a range of guidelines in terms of, of health and safety. That will apply uh, in all sets of, of circumstances, but I'm not going to take that, that away. I will not be the minister uh, who is seeking uh, by the front door or the back door to destroy our grammar school system. I call Jonathan Buckley. Question number four, Mr Speaker. Uh, thank the member for his question. To help support schools address many of the new pressures arising as a result of COVID-19, I have announced a significant additional funding uh, with the support of the executive to help support the education sector. To date, extra allocations of $6.9 million have been made to the Education Authority, specifically earmarked for special educational needs pressures arising from COVID-19 and the education restart. I have asked the EA to continue to monitor funding uh, requirements as the pandemic progresses in order to inform potential departmental bids for additional resources as required. Jonathan Buckley, supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I know the Minister will fully appreciate uh, the devastating impact COVID-19 has had on those children with special educational needs and join with me in, in appreciating their tenacity, both the children, teachers and parents that look after these young people. Can the Minister provide an update in relation to the transformation and improvement programme of special educational needs services? I'll, I'll be happy to. Um, could I maybe say as well that the, the, sorry, the, the member mentions teachers and parents. I, mean, I would want to place on record, I, I've done so before, but I think it's important as we move towards the Christmas period, particularly for those with special educational needs, but across the board, uh, my thanks and appreciation, I think appreciation for all of us, for the role that parents, principals, teachers, indeed all educational staff have played in ensuring that, that education continues. Specifically, I think on the question that, that he asked, uh, in September, the SEN governance uh, group was established uh, to maintain strategic oversight of the implementation of improvements being made by the e within the EA and the department. Uh, there's obviously been considerable levels of, of criticisms and various reports have been produced uh, and it's important I think those are done on a, uh, that those are answered on a strategic direction. The EA has recently established a programme of improvements through its SEND uh, strategic development programme. Uh, which provides a single coordinating governance structure for the SEND transformation agenda across Northern Ireland. The programme draws together uh, ongoing multi-agency uh, SEND development work, but is also defining a single strategic plan to address the, whole, the wide-ranging um, recommendations for further change, which have resulted from various uh, review reports across uh, the last year or two, including the 2020 Northern Ireland Office uh, SEND report, the SEND Learning Journey recommendations and indeed the recent report by the Northern Children's Commissioner. Call Stuart Dixon. Thank you, Minister. Minister, um, you, uh, could you explain to the House why the School Restart Fund does not apply to special schools and the failure to not apply it is that an act of discrimination against special schools? No, it's not. And the member, maybe I'm maybe being a little bit pedantic, I think he's actually referring to the Engage programme on Restart because restart is the wider package of measures that are being taken into account. As I indicated in terms of restart, 6.9 million has been directly put in in terms of uh, special educational needs. Engage because it uh, is targeted across the 11.2 million at the mainstream schools. I've instructed directly because there's more of a one-to-one -one intervention is required in terms of uh, special schools for the EA to work directly with the special schools to provide uh, provision that would be of a similar nature to engage. So that is, uh, is why, because the, the way the budgets go engage has been delegated down to schools. As the member uh, would also be aware, school budgets within um, special educational needs, and I think there's a good argument as to whether there should be a lot more flexibility put into that, but they are actually not devolved down to the schools themselves. They're handled in the EA level, so therefore I've given the instructions to EA, whereas the engage programme the flexibility on how that money is used is devolved down directly to the individual schools. So that need will be met within special schools, but it will come through the EA rather than the Engage programme. I call Karen Mullen. 
Minister, the Education Committee heard evidence a number of weeks ago which suggested the Department of Health did not fulfil its obligations in cooperation with education for children with special education needs. Can the Minister give an assessment of the current levels of cooperation which exists between education and health when it comes to supporting children with special education needs? I think we'll, we'll look at that. And, um, I think I would also maybe should say at this stage I'm taking on board some of the suggestions. I know one of the suggestions, I think, um, to be fair, while, while we will often clash, I think there was a reasonable enough suggestion that came from the Chair in terms of looking at where we could uh, develop a stakeholder engagement, I think, of a better nature uh, and of some form of reference group for vulnerable children. I'm trying to take that forward with officials. Uh, as the member, to some extent, alludes to, that's not something which is purely something that can happen within the Department of Education. It is that level of, of cooperation. Look, I, I think. Perhaps much of that question, to some extent, may be better answered by the, the Health Minister, but I think there has been good work. I think it is beginning to improve. But there's no doubt that turning the aspirations of what is there in terms of cooperation into real cooperation on the ground at times can be challenging in, in that regard, and we will, it is a continual uh, effort to be able to, to do that. It is why I think it is important also that uh, as we work towards as consultation comes to an end on the SEN regulations, and that is also something which can be brought forward in terms of particularly, because allied to the regulations as well, will be the code of practice, which I think will also be a driver for improvement in what we can do uh, for our, our young people with special educational needs. I'd call Jim Allister. Uh, extra resources are very welcome in this area, but does the Minister agree there needs to be better alignment between the release of resources and the a further improvement of the statementing process. The present targets still remain disappointing, and you can have all the resources you like, but if you haven't got the kids statemented, then you're not marrying the two, and that's really where the solution lies. Well, I agree with them. Up, yes, up to a point. I mean, look, sometimes with, with all things, I mean, resources are required to be able to do certain things in that regard. Resources in and of themselves are not the complete picture. I mean, as such, uh, as I think I gave answers. Um, don't think I have the figures directly to hand, uh, but in terms of the statementing process, there have been considerable improvements in terms of the timescales. The, the timescales have come down, in that bit, and they started from a very, very poor base from a year or two ago. Uh, the timescales have reduced considerably. Well, you know, I see somebody shaking their head from the sedentary position who clearly doesn't have the figures either in front of me. I did reveal those at the, uh, at the last question time. To be fair, for once before he gets a little bit paranoid, I'm not accusing the chair of doing that. Of doing that. Uh, for, once, for once, he is an innocent man in, in that regard. Uh, but no, the figures would suggest that the very long-term weights. So, for example, uh, if you go back a, sh a number of months ago, there were a number of children that were waiting, say, more than a year and a half for, uh, a, uh, for a statement. Uh, that is no longer the case. There have been reductions in all those, those elements. So it is about making that level of, of progress. But the member is right in terms of creating that level of alignment. And I think that is where particularly the... Uh, trying to get a much more joined-up approach is actually the purpose, particularly of the SEN regulations. That's why it's out for consultation. Why it's important to think that um, that we can move ahead with that uh, as soon and as much as we can do in terms of the resources that are there. Moving on, I call Chris Stafford. Number five, sir. Thank you, Member, for his question. Uh, as a control school, the Education Authority is responsible for minor capital works within the school. So they have advised the subject to availability of funding and prioritisation of other works. Consideration is being given to progressing minor works at Nettlefield Primary. I know the, the member takes a close interest in Nettlefield. I believe it was one of the schools that myself and the permanent secretary had visited, one of the earliest schools, even pre-COVID. It does seem a long time ago. But specifically, they are looking to progress minor works um, in the next financial year relating to the toilets, related to the roofing, and I know there is particular danger with the windows. As one of the others, and the concrete steps outside the school office, which again could prove a hazard. All those matters are being considered for progression by the Education Authority, who will deal with the operational side of it at that level. Christopher Sauber, supplementary. Thank you, sir. And I declare an interest as a past pupil in Nettlefield Primary School. Uh, I am grateful to the Minister for the answer that he has given. The Minister knows that this is a a unique building and I think is actually a listed building which complicates uh, the need for improvement to it. But can I ask the Minister to please, as he has seen himself, the state of some of the rotten window frames and just the general 
poor state that some parts of that building are in, can I please ask him to do everything within his power to process this as quickly as possible and get the work carried out because the school really, really needs it? I appreciate that. And again, I think one of the restrictions has been with the listed states. That has not been something which is unique entirely to Nettlefield. And sometimes the listed status happens in buildings which, with the best will in the world, is not preserving some great Georgian architecture, but uh, is holding back uh, measures at times that need to be taken in, in terms of pure health and safety. Look, I would be aware that the EA are cognizant of the issues of, of Nettlefield. Whenever the, I suppose the problem is, again, that whenever the last call was made out for minor works, there was around about 6,000 applications. About 600 of those have been able to be funded so far. So there are a lot of demand out there, but I can give the assurance that the EA will be taking it seriously. And in no way will the fact that the member is a past pupil of Nettlefield be any disadvantage to the school. <laughs> they call Matthew O'Toole. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I welcome uh, the answer to the question. Uh, though I'm not a past pupil, it, 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 clearly Nettlefield has real issues, and it's a notable building, and it really needs the work uh, that my South Belfast colleague um, has asked for. Can I ask briefly about the broader capital budget in relation to the Department of Education? Has the minister had any conversations with the finance minister about ensuring that the capital allocation that sits with you this year is going to be spent in year, and none of it's going to be handed back, given that it's been a unique year in terms of getting capital spending out the door? Look, I understand that, and I think that the department was uh, well aware um, of, of that. And as such, for instance, there has been, for instance, some money has been able to be released through discussions with DOF into, for instance, the EA on issues such as even in terms of additional uh, bus allocation, in terms of procurement on that basis, and in terms of a range of other uh, procurements. As much as possible, I appreciate particularly there was a level of disruption around the spring period in terms of capital spend. I think some of that has been captured back up. And in terms of the broader budget as we move ahead towards 2021, on both capital resources, while um, things will still be very tight across the board, I had very useful conversations with the Minister of Finance just yesterday on the, the broader budgetary issues covering both resource and capital demands. Call Meg Nesbitt. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm, I'm sure the Minister will join with me in uh, congratulating Nettlefields in surviving the many challenges it's faced down the years. Uh, I understand the Minister has visited uh, West Winds Primary in the constituency we, we both serve. Would he join me in congratulating the senior leadership team uh, in terms of the energy they brought to school life and also support their desire to see the same improvements in the infrastructure of the school that has been seen in, in other primaries in the area? in recent years? Uh, yes, certainly I would congratulate, I think, the, the hard work and success uh, of the school, not just obviously under its current principal, but under the previous principal as well. I think it has been a uh, success story and, and particularly a beacon of success in light. I, I should perhaps indicate, uh, then just to keep people are, are, check, are checking the register, so to speak, uh, that I visited in the capacity, I think, as the member did as well, separately, in my capacity as an MLA for the area, rather than my capacity as uh, Minister for Education, I was able to view, I think, some of the challenges that are there, some of the improvements that need to be made from the physical infrastructure, and certainly speaking as an, an MLA, I'm very much in favour um, of those, and indeed I want to see the best possible um, uh, availability of space and uh, construction for all our pupils, not just in the great constituency of Strangford, but beyond the, uh, beyond the constituency throughout Northern Ireland. Call Nicola Brogan. Uh, Ken Corlin, and I thank the Minister for his update on Nettlefield Primary School. Can I also ask the Minister for an update on the school educational campus in Oma, which is my constituency of West Tyrone, please? The member will be, will be aware from that there's a determination to carry. I, I should first of all, I suppose, this is the first education question time, and I suppose I'll be uh, seeing her tomorrow at the, the Education Committee. Welcome her to, to her place. Uh, work is continuing to go on uh, with that. Recently, I'd taken uh, a position to the executive, which the executive all agreed that we need to move ahead with Struhl. Uh, I think there is still some work to be absolutely finalised between the Department of Finance and Treasury. It was something, again, without breaking any confidentiality, I was able to directly raise with the finance minister yesterday where finance is, is pushing ahead. We need, I think, um, a final position just of Treasury to confirm all of that. But the determination, this is the probably the biggest capital project I think Northern Ireland has, has ever faced. And there is a strong determination, not just within the Department of Education, not just from the Minister of Education, but from the whole executive, I think, to carry on to make sure that this is brought to fruition. I call Chris Little. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I ask the Minister what the monetary scale is of the maintenance backlog across Northern Ireland? Um, I don't have those figures directly to hand, but I'll be happy to provide those to the, uh, to the member. That ends the period for a list of questions, members, and we will now move on to 15 minutes of topical questions. And I call Trevor Lunn. Mr. Speaker, could I ask the Minister if he has read the excellent independent report on integrated education yet? And if he has, uh, has he any initial comment to make on the recommendations it contains? Well, yes, of course, I had uh, read the report. Indeed, um, I had to, to take some, um, I was going to say, imaginative action to make sure that it was actually published on, on time from the, the, the last mandate, because I think it was actually produced in terms of its final version during the period of PERDA. So I had to make sure then it was able to be uh, released. I think actually to cover the situation, we were not supposed to release anything in, in PERDA. I remember actually it had, had to be released at a quarter to 10 on election day um, in 2017. So yes, I have read the report. A number of the, um, there have been a number of the, the recommendations have been put in, uh, into place. There is also, I think, reference that it would be one of the, where there is outstanding recommendations and Maybe that in terms of recommendations, a number are sort of part of a wider picture. Some may not be 100% appropriate, but the consideration of that uh, would be in the wider uh, revised draft terms of reference that hopefully will be part of the independent review. And I'm hopefully bringing it, um, I've submitted a paper to the executive on that. Uh, but it would mean then that any independent review would take forward anything that is outstanding from that. Trevor Lawrence, supplementary. Yes, I thank, you. I thank the Minister for his answer. I'd like to refer him to recommendation number 17, uh, which suggests that his department should be more proactive in advising schools about the transformation process. Is he satisfied that the department historically has delivered on its statutory obligation to facilitate and encourage integrated education? Well, I should say that while history was one of my favourite subjects at school, and I suppose it's something which is always any a lot of politicians who know that will always get accused of being uh, immersed in. I I'm not really think there's a great deal of point in, in trying to retrospectively decide what should have happened five years ago or ten years ago. I think trying to meet the challenges of where we are now is probably the more appropriate bit. And as I indicated, uh, as part of the outstanding recommendations, we'll look at uh, what is appropriate then to be put in place and how it can be put in place will uh, lie with the um, independent, uh, independent review that uh, hopefully she will soon be initiated. Caller Leah Flynn. Um, I would just like to um, state first of all that I welcome the recent announcement um, from the Minister, the £5 million pound that uh, was going towards schools to help support students with their mental health and wellbeing, although if I'm correct, £1.5 million of that came from the Department of Health. So my question to the Minister is, um, does he think that that amount of £5 million was sufficient? And is he planning to submit any further bids in relation to this? Gormiogat. Thank, thank the member for her question. Um, there's actually two funds, and she may slightly be mixing up the two. The £5 million that, that was recently allocated, um, I think, strictly speaking, £4.75 million of that was directly to schools, the other quarter of a million was particularly the youth services, because obviously there would be gaps there within that. That was specifically money that the that I'd put forward as a proposal. The executive um, then uh, endorsed that and provided that money via the COVID side of things. The 1.5 million that she's referring to, there is there are plans um, to have a wider um, embedded six and a half million within budget. That, that's in addition to the five million. Um, and the six and a half million would be for mental health and, and well-being with that contribution uh, from health because of the level of crossover issues that are there. And the aim would be for that to roll out in the new year. Where is the five million for COVID? And there's, there's, there's no doubt while there may be some possibilities to look at what could be done next year as well, COVID funding will still be available in 21-22, as I'm sure the finance minister who's here would, would indicate. It's of a, roughly about a quarter of what it was in total. So there's still the possibility to bid for some further element of COVID money. But I think the aim is, in addition to the COVID money, to have something secured within the budget that will be there on a rolling annual basis. Of the original 6.5 million that would be intended, uh, as this is the first year of this additional funding, some of that will be on a level of pilot programming because we have to actually see what works in practice, um, what, you know, 
I suppose, if you like, may work in West Belfast, won't necessarily work in West Tyrone. What works in a primary sector, what works in a special school, what works in a post-primary may not be the same. So part of it will be a, le a certain level of testing out and then trying to embed what is very successful and maybe there will be a level of shift of resources. Yes, and I'd uh, like to thank the Minister for his response. And maybe if the Minister could outline then um, the time frame also for the delivery of the, uh, the emotional health and wellbeing framework, um, and if the Minister can commit to making this an urgent priority coming into the new year of 2021. I think, in terms of the framework, this would, as opposed, try to marry in the two issues, so it would be earlier in the new year, would be for both. Call Michelle McElveen. Mr Speaker, and from the outset, as it's part to this question, I'd like to declare an interest as a Governor of Nandrum College in Cumber. Um, could I ask the Minister if he can provide an update on any discussions being held in relation to controlled post-primary school provision in the arts area? Thank the Member for uh, her question. There have been, as, as the Member is, is very well aware, there has been pressure on places, particularly some of the post-primaries in the arts area in recent years. In light of this pressure to meet that, there was an allocation of 90 um, extra places across the Strangford constituency in advance of the 2020 process. We, we tried to some extent to get ahead with that. Now, there will be some reduction in the pressures in 2021 because there's a smaller cohort that will be transferring. Um, so, in addition, I've put an initial 10 places uh, on in advance of 2021, but my department stands ready to allocate further temporary variations. Obviously, for permanent change, it would then require a development proposal to take place. Um, what I would say as well is that to try to judge where there are pressures within the area, I want also across the board in Northern Ireland uh, to also look at a new policy of a level of right-sizing and normalisation, as it's called, so that if a number of schools, for instance, have year-on-year -year issues with getting temporary variations, that that can be taken into account. Now, I think legally the definition for development proposal will be a significant change, but it strikes me that where we are getting scenarios where that is simply reflecting what has happened on the ground, uh, that will need to be put into to place. Obviously, very specifically as regards any development proposal itself um, would come as a legal process to which myself uh, as Minister in the Department would have to then give a direct verdict on, so I obviously couldn't comment on any individual development proposal. I thank the Minister for his response. Both parents uh, and pupils are keen to have post-16 provision at Nandrum and Glastry College is long overdue a new build. Could the Minister provide an update on what consideration is being given to both of those projects? Well, at the moment, um, again, if there was, for instance, a change, I suppose it would be a significant change, if we're moving to a scenario uh, in any particular school where there is a sixth form provision as opposed to then school ending at, at 16. I, I'm not, uh, I don't have any particular problem with that per se, but obviously that itself would come as a development proposal. As uh, the current situation, obviously then um, the, any development proposal will need to come through the managing authority. Currently, at present, there hasn't been any published DPs for either Nendrum College or Glastry College from the EA, and if that was something then to be considered, it would have to be initiated through uh, those organisations. It may be that, um, and again, perhaps it's been overtaken by um, other events, uh, the member may want to raise that directly with the new chair of the Education Authority, Mr Barry Mulholland, who has been announced today. Call Emma Rogan. Go ahead, Mayor. Good. Minister, we are all too aware of the shortcomings in recent years in terms of administrative and operational processes involved in the provision um, for children with special educational needs. The new SEN framework and the associated regulations in the Code of Practice will hopefully represent a new beginning in supporting these children and their families. Can I ask the Minister to outline a time frame for the full implementation of these new arrangements? Well, the current arrangements are, indeed, in terms of the SEN regulations and the code of practice, I think it's something that all of us would welcome. It is out in terms of the fine detail, uh, concluding it, it, it's the end of consultation will be before the, the end of Christmas. I would hope to move ahead with that in as full as way as possible as soon as I can. I think the only issue which, again, I would urge members around the chamber to support there will be a significant financial uh, investment that will be required. So that at, at present, there has been within this year's budget around about seven and a half million has been directly allocated to that. 
a full year cost will be, uh, will be 30 million. And so therefore, either uh, resources will have to be provided or be found. The speed of movement on that, to some extent, will depend upon the wider financial settlement that we're able to reach. And I know, uh, at least in terms of draft budgets, and I believe the Finance Minister is hoping to bring proposals to the, to the House fairly soon. I think, to be fair to the Finance Minister, we are next year going to be potentially in quite a difficult situation across the board um, because we are effectively, once you take out uh, a particular elements of COVID or I think at least one major ring fence side of it, uh, the financial settlement that, that, is, that is being provided to the executive is likely to be pretty close to a flat line cash, which will make things very difficult. But I think that in terms of prioritisation, uh, implementing the SEN regulations is a, is a critical commitment and I will be doing everything I can to move that uh, as full as it can, as fast as it can. Minister, um, you may be aware in the Downpatrick area of my own constituency of South Down, there's a serious shortage of special school places and I want to take this opportunity to commend the great work and the leadership of Knock Evans Special School. This school is well oversubscribed, um, indicating that there is a need for increased provision in our area. Um, will the Minister commit to looking into this to ensure the provision is available for local families in the area so they don't have to travel miles and miles for suitable placement? And again, there's always a bit of a balance um, in trying to ensure that the people don't have to travel too far while ensuring that there's an element of specialist quality. Because if, if you take within any side of things on it and simply spread that, that too thinly, then you don't get that, that, that level of quality. If there is, for instance, to be either um, additional provision, certainly in terms of either additional school or units, Directly, I suppose, at first instance, it would be for the EA. If it requires a development proposal, then that would be something that, that as Minister, I would have to uh, sign off on. But certainly, we want to make sure that, that every provision is made for a special educational needs students. I call Keith Buchanan. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Minister, you're obviously aware of the uh, trends in international mathematics and science study and how to write that down. Tim's recent report into Northern Ireland's position in mathematics. Can you give the House an update on your opinion on that a good report and obviously what Northern Ireland did in that? Certainly, I, I would welcome that report. It is uh, in, in dark days that we've had fairly sort of good news. Um, of, across the world, I think we've ended up on the Tim's report that's been published today on mathematics of being the seventh highest performer in the world of those who uh, put in. I think there was around about 58 countries that were in. Uh, of, those that, of those countries that are wholly within Europe, uh, we actually were the top European uh, country. And that indeed, um, we significantly outperformed, and I suppose to do this on a cross-community basis, we su suitably outperformed pupils in both England and the Republic of Ireland um, in, in relation to that. There was also, I think, in science, a strong performance with uh, about 18 countries being grouped ahead of us, 28 uh, below us. Um, and it should also be remembered that a number of jurisdictions did not participate in TIMS possibly with a suspicion that they wouldn't have got the result that, that they wanted, which makes our position even more impressive. The findings, I think, emphasise uh, that education, particularly for year six pupils in Northern Ireland, have a high academic success. Uh, there's very little problems with school discipline. We have very safe and orderly uh, classrooms. It is also the case, I think, and this is maybe a lesson as well, that we're uh, the most successful countries are the ones with the, least, the smallest gap between those of socioeconomic advantage and disadvantage. And while, again, there's a good deal of work to be done on this in Northern Ireland, it is noticeable that um, uh, our figures show that the gap between uh, more affluent and more socially deprived children was considerably lower at both maths and science than it would be for the international comparators of those that were in involved in terms. So it shows actually in many ways that there's been a lot of good work, but of course there's a lot of further good work still needed to be done. Okay, about a minute left to call Keith Buchanan supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thanks, Minister, for answer so far. Just with regard to obviously um, this year and the difficult year it's been with regard to digital learning and online learning, etc. What's your opinion on the Tim's findings on, on that learning environment, basically by digital means? Again, there's been a situation. The Tim's findings again showed that we were considerably ahead of the international comparators. Uh, there is issues around, which I know even in the previous ministerial question mark over ensuring that there's broadband availability and there's always more that can be done. But what it did show that 96% uh, that of students said they had access to a computer or tablet, that compares, um, it's much uh, well ahead of what is, what is there. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean they have individual access at home. 
Um, and I suppose to cover the situation, particularly during lockdown, there has been so far over 10,000 devices have been provided to our most disadvantaged and vulnerable learners. Again, there is further work to be done, but again, on the comparisons that we have, and we can only take this as an independent report, looking at our comparisons with other jurisdictions, we are well ahead of the, of the, um, of the international average. And I should also indicate that, that many of the um, very affluent economies throughout the world were part of TIM, so this is not, if you like, comparing Northern Ireland uh, with countries always that are, are, have levels of, of difficulty in that regard. Members, time is up, and uh, members, please take your ease.